Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, lobbying and uh, transparency in politics. But before we all get too serious, please allow me to talk to you about sex. Uh, you see, I was born in the Soviet Union and in the USSR, uh, nobody was having sex, uh, at least officially. It was very much there, but uh, it was not talked about. So lobbying or an act of one person exerting influence on another person in some ways is like sex. It's not talked about. In our democratic societies, we often pretend that it's just not there. Well, actually, lobbying is part and parcel of decision-making, whether it's the German Bundestag, the Polish same, or the British Parliament. Now, lobbying, also just like sex, can uh, take different forms and happen in a lot of places. Uh, you meet with people, people call you, they get hold of you in the hallway. Um, just recently, uh, a lobbyist told me that an average act of lobbying takes seven to eight minutes. This is the amount of time you need to walk with a parliamentarian door to door from one meeting to another and discuss things that really matter. Now, parliamentarians uh, like to present themselves as hermits uh, that often shy away from meeting people, right? If you look at their agendas, that is the impression you can easily get. Uh, it looks like their routines uh, uh, are very reclusive and what they do is they spend days in this uh, political prayer to their gods uh, that often miraculously result in a draft law or an amendment to it. We all know this is not what they do. This is not what they should do. We want our parliamentarians uh, to meet people. Uh, we want them to have uh, the best, most informed uh, decisions. Um, and it's clear that the only way possible to do that is through communicating with different various groups. If a parliamentarian tells you otherwise, it's clear that they're either lying or they're not telling you the truth. And in this case, the question is whether we should have selected them into the office. So I hope you agree with me. It's okay that parliamentarians hang out with others as long as they make no distinction between big business, labor unions, or non-governmental organizations, because this is really what equal access is about. It's uh, something which lies at the forefront, at the core of any good and fair decision making. Uh, unfortunately, um, the challenge often is to understand how to go about such things. And uh, if you think of it, our laws do not really uh, manage to capture the pulse of uh, lobbying in our political life. Way too often, they provide little to no incentive for politicians, businesses, uh, non-governmental organizations alike to actually report acts of lobbying, report meetings, and tell us what was discussed at such meetings. It's clear that uh, such lack of transparency creates fertile ground for political corruption and the abuse of power by the select few for the benefit of the select few. Now, the question is, what do you do when nobody is telling you anything? Now, I treat transparency as a habit. To me, for any habit to take root, uh, literally, you need to think big but start small. Uh, you don't run a marathon in, on day one. It gets even trickier when you want somebody else to take up a particular habit. Uh, just think of it, politicians uh, and businesses for that matter, they don't get pressured easily into things they don't like. For them to start acting in a new manner, they need to understand how behaving differently actually benefits them. And that's how all of us operate, that's absolutely natural. Uh, the thing is that the context, the environment they work in is really, really tough. Uh, there's so many misunderstandings, fears, uh, uh, taboos that surround the issue of lobbying and reporting what is it that you do. Uh, 
there are plenty of studies that show that lobbying actually uh, usually happens behind closed doors. Um, a study recently published in Lithuania uh, showed that uh, uh, it's uh, much uh, more effective. Usually, you would uh, influence politicians through connections and unofficial meetings. It happens when we don't see it. It also has been happening this way for decades in a lot of countries for centuries. So it's not only hard to see, it's hard to change. It usually is expected that uh, lobbying would be reported by businesses, business associations, non-governmental organizations. Uh, but we decided to approach it in a new novel way, in a slightly unorthodox manner. We also wanted to have something which is quite concrete, tangible, and achievable, so we decided to focus on a narrow group of politicians and propose they make a small step toward, towards transparency. So we approached our parliamentarians, all 141 of them, and proposed that they would start declaring their meetings more actively. We thought this is a building block, we take it from there, and we see what happens next. Now, I, I heard some giggles when I made the analogy to uh, sex while discussing lobbying. I'd like to come completely clean now. Um, the story, the success story I'm about to share with you actually is an accident. We did not intend it. We did not intend for it to happen. Uh, our initial idea was something completely uh, different. Uh, it was uh, many months ago, in the dark, 2017, and we would, uh, during our meetings with parliamentarians, time and again hear that for them it was very difficult to report meetings with interest groups because the parliamentary website just didn't allow for it. It was very cumbersome, very hard to use. So we thought we can help. We thought, why don't we develop an online platform that would allow our parliamentarians to do it in a much easier manner? We fundraised a couple of thousands of euros. We had meetings with our parliamentarians, actually all fractions in the parliament uh, except one. Uh, we tested the tool, we launched it, and it failed miserably. Uh, true, some parliamentarians were using uh, this online platform, manosusitikimai.lt, mymeetings.lt. However, uh, those were not the numbers we were looking for. And sure, the mayor of Vilnius was really enthusiastic. One of his advisors uh, used the platform, but uh, parliamentarians either stayed put or were using the official parliamentary website instead. So, what happened? Uh, I think that um, a couple of things went the wrong or the right way along the way. First, Following our meetings with the fractions in the parliament, a couple of active politicians, parliamentarians, initiated changes to the website that the parliament had and actually made it much easier for parliamentarians to publish meetings on the official website instead. Also, in the hindsight, I think we were overly optimistic, too enthusiastic about the whole idea and might have gotten the message that parliamentarians were sending us wrong. I think sometimes they might have been overly polite and diplomatic about what is it that we were to do, and we were not reflective enough. Thanks God, we developed this platform following the logic of this sort of minimum viable product. So it was okay for us to fail, uh, as long as we could react quickly, and it also allowed us to think on our feet. Besides, there was something else that we did which brought this uh, whole initiative uh, into public eye in any case. You see, uh, when developing the platform, we wanted to have a baseline. We wanted to understand what the context that we bring in this initiative in was. So we uh, decided we will look at the meetings that the parliamentarians already had. It was a new parliament. It was elected into office just half a year before. So naturally, we said, look, uh, Let's look at the spring semester, the spring term 2017, and count uh, who parliamentarians have been meeting uh, then. It took us three weeks to do that. We went through the agendas of all parliamentarians, and all of a sudden we realized that we were onto something. We had at least 45 parliamentarians declaring at least 
475 meetings. So we knew that we're looking at something which is awesome because we're about to bust the myth that parliamentarians actually don't meet anyone. That got a lot of attention. Uh, and sure, we published a lot of additional data alongside. We had the list of parliamentarians. We could rank them. Uh, we showed uh, how different factions looked like. And uh, we could easily say which groups the parliamentarians were meeting most of the time. We also got a chance to speak about things which were much more than just meetings. We spoke about the law and lobbying, about the need to change the law. We spoke about the need to amend the official definition of what a lobbyist is, and that sometimes business associations, non-governmental organizations, labor unions alike, all engage in the act of lobbying. We spoke about the need for high-ranking politicians and public servants to start declaring acts of them being lobbied so that we could cross-check and cross-examine what the political life in the parliament looks like. Now, you could ask, well, so what? Where did it actually uh, get you? Well, we've been doing it for the past two years, um, and uh, what we see is that the number of parliamentarians declaring such meetings has gone up twice. And the number of meetings being declared has gone up 1.5 times. More than that, uh, the parliament uh, just recently, well, half a year ago, received a set of amendments to the law on lobbying from the government. And while I believe that the amendments should be further improved, it's clear that politicians and public servants alike across uh, the entire country have taken notice of our work. For instance, in our study just recently on Lithuanian municipalities, we saw that in half of them, mayors and heads of municipal administrations actually declared meetings with whom they met. And that was something which four years ago was simply not present. Also, what we managed to get uh, was something which we couldn't really expect along the way. We realized that uh, uh, we provided people with clear incentives to think of declaring meetings as something which benefited them and we provided them with achievable goals which they could easily identify with. Because, look, clearly uh, the change didn't happen just because of us. Sure, we would follow up with the, the parliamentarians every single time we would do the overview, but it was just as important that the Speaker of the Parliament would continuously and publicly emphasize the need to report meetings if you are a parliamentarian. Uh, the factions would repeatedly republish the data that we would gather. Media would increasingly be more nuanced and detailed in its approach to the issue and would be asking harder, more difficult questions. We could really feel the pulse of the entire conversation moving forward. Also, perhaps we contributed a little bit by being there all the time and uh, providing new data uh, which we were able to gather. In this way, sort of keeping the fire burning, we now can say that uh, newcomers to the parliament are more likely uh, to report meetings than the old timers. We know that men and women report meeting in the same way. However, if you are in the opposition, uh, you probably meet fewer business people. Our data suggests that those parties that are in power meet business people three times more than those in the opposition. And, of course, uh, uh, it's essential to understand that our message all along, from the beginning onwards, was that the amount of transparency that we could get really is in the parliamentarians' hands. They're the ones who can decide how much uh, information they can provide and what information is really important, because that really is the essence of this do-it-yourself toolkit. What we can do we can offer a standard, we can make sure that we're there and we will follow up and that we will name the champions, but at the end of the day, accountability is a verb. For you to be accountable, you need to practice accountability. And you are the one to decide how much of it you really want. We can't really force you to do much. Now, where do we go from here? Uh, we will be 
uh, there, counting meetings. Uh, we will also continue our work, uh, advocacy work, on lobbying. Um, and I think this is essential for parliamentarians to know because if they decide to invest in their transparency more, we will notice. If they decide that they don't want to be more transparent, we will notice as well and we will react accordingly. Of course, this also uh, means that uh, they will have to think of something which they haven't really thought before. And that is that uh, a lot of stuff really is in their hands and they're the owners of their own narrative. I think things are looking right because if you look at the past year, what we can see is a couple of positive changes. Uh, first of all, our revamped parliamentary website now features personal profiles of parliamentarians with their agendas front and center. And I understand the emphasis was made that this is there because meetings are important. In the fall of 2018, our parliament also started to publish a lot of stuff in an open data format. And in this way, it now has become one of the more open parliaments in the world. Uh, to me, it's clear that political corruption is still there and there's plenty of space for backroom deals, but I wanted to share with you this story because uh, it's a start. Uh, after all, just like Justice Brandeis once said, sunlight is the best disinfectant and electricity is the best police person. To me, uh, it's also an example of how small changes taken by a large collective can mean bigger than expected uh, small steps taken by a large collective can mean uh, bigger than expected changes across the board and uh, create new exciting opportunities on the ground. And this is what we all want, don't we? Uh, because any meaningful change uh, happens, uh, mutual trust happens only when we work together. Thank you.